Hello, welcome to This is Ali Nassan. and I'm here today uh, with one of our star residents here at HSTM Endo, uh, Dr. Stephanie Jew. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So, Stephanie had about three cases that you wanted to share with our audience, so that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm sure they're going to appreciate that. So, let's see what you have and let's get into it right away. So, the first patient was a 44 year old male. He presented just saying that his back teeth were falling apart, not having any pain. Ended up doing two root canals on 14 and 31 so this was on 31 and then also on number 14 here and then there also was a tooth that ended up needing a retreat so the tooth had previously been treated the patient didn't know if it was by an endodontist or a general dentist some number of years ago um, and there was a missed root so it was teromolaris extra root on a lower first molar so when we did the testing the diagnosis was previously treated with symptomatic apical periodontitis so the treatment plan was to do the non-surgical retreatment. So while we were doing the retreatment, we were removing some gutta percha and we were using the F3 to remove the gutta percha and a piece of it had fractured off in the canal. So we were actually able to retrieve it with the help of Dr. Nassay by using lots of ultrasonics and vibrating it to make sure that it was really loose, then used the cotton pliers and gripped them with the tip of the hemostats and uh, was able to get the file out. There's a little trick there is because the head of the hemostat does not have enough power to mm -hmm. grab. It keeps slipping over the broken segment. Sometimes grabbing the, uh, I'm sorry, the cotton pliers doesn't have the power. Grabbing the head of the cotton pliers with another hemostat can kind of it's like double lock so that it could be stronger to pull that out, right? Yep. And it was, we were able to get it out in one piece and confirm that with the radiograph, then got the rest of the gutta percha out, placed calcium hydroxide, and brought them back for another appointment to complete the root canal. So when we brought him back for the next appointment, we got everything super clean, made sure to take a radiograph so we can see all the gutta percha was removed. And I took some photos of the access so that you can see all four canals are nice and clean there. You can even see some calcifications around the canal that was previously missed. And then we were able to obturate and then we placed some blue BC liner over the orifices just to make sure that it was sealed and then it wouldn't get reinfected again while the patient was getting the crown by the dental student. Yeah, I mean, the contrast the uh, uh, liner over your root canal therapy will ensure that later on if the general mm -hmm. dentist goes back and puts an aesthetic core on top of it and if you god forbid ever have to go and revise the tooth or not you I mean you know patients obviously live a long life and they will down the line may require retreatment it just makes it a little bit easier to find the canals on the way back when you have a contrast C liner underneath your core so that was beautifully done but you wanted to talk a little bit about the different aspects of it by doing a little bit of literature review right mm -hmm. so what do you have for us on that front so um, the first thing that kind of came up was that when we're doing retreatments in endodontics, we use chloroform. So when patients, and when I first heard that word uh, mentioned in residency, I was you know, a little bit skeptical of using something like that with that kind of has not necessarily the best connotation. So I did a little dive into the literature and found that there are studies all the way back to 1992 that show the use of chloroform in the endodontic operatory. And uh, they did a lot of studies looking at different aspects of the chloroform to make sure that it's safe. So the one from 1982 by McDonald and Beyer showed that utilizing common endodontic treatment methods and using chloroform, there was no negative health effects to the dentist or the assistant, and the air vapor levels were well below the OSHA standards. Another study in 1998 showed that the amount of solvent that leaches out through the apical foramen is 1,000 to 15,000 times below what the toxic dose would be considered. So then there's another one from 1999 that just kind of showed that chloroform, halothane, and xylene can soften the dentin a little bit. So something else to just kind of think of when you're using chloroform in a retreatment. But all these kind of show that it really is a safe material to use during a retreatment. So that's very important because obviously safety is important for ourselves, our staff, as well as the patient. So chloroform is an incredibly helpful solvent when it comes to revision because mm -hmm. it can dissolve gutta percha as a lipid solvent very easily. So McDonald's study really assures us that it's safe for everyone, and it is because of the fact that it's hydrophobic it really is difficult to actually extrude it unless you are using very poor needle handling techniques where you're locking the needle and then therefore overcoming the apical pressure and then extruding it otherwise it's always going to come back up through the top of the tooth you know uh, being hydrophobic and so it's yeah it's very important the softening of the dentin was actually interesting and, and surprising in, in addition with the use of your chelating agents mm -hmm. if you have to bypass a ledge maybe it would be helpful <laughs> yeah you know? 
something um, else to consider. A little trick I found also is, that, by the way, chloroform is a very strong antimicrobial agent. Mm -hmm. So my personal theory, and there's nowhere in the literature, and I've discussed that here with you guys in the literature uh, reviews, is that part of the reason why retreatments has, have such a nice success rate is probably because of chloroform, because it can totally dissolve the biofilm and everything around the area. So despite the fact that we sometimes leave a lot of material after a revision based on the studies, mm -hmm. I think the fact that chloroform is disinfected and killed everything uh, is partially helpful. And also it's a non-conductor, so it helps with the apex locator reading as well during your revisions. Mm -hmm. All right, so what else do you think is interesting about this case? Um, so the other thing was the file breakage. So there's a more recent paper um, in the IEJ 2022 by Dr. Trucci, present status and future directions, removal of fractured instruments, and um, kind of goes into the two ways that instruments fracture through cyclic fatigue and torsional fatigue. Cyclic fatigue being repetitive tension and compression cycles when the canal is kind of going through a curve, the other one torsional fatigue when the file kind of gets stuck and then continues twisting so it's kind of binding and then it breaks off. So most fractured instruments are made of nitai, so you know mainly our rotary instruments with the mean fragment length being around three millimeters. Obviously our fragment length that broke off was significantly longer than that. Um, so another study showed that files that have a larger diameter or more taper led to a longer fragment section which is kind of what you could describe the F3 as. And in my experience, if a, fra if a fracture on a file occurs high up on the shank, that usually is a manufacturer defect. Because mm -hmm. the manufacturer defect is present during the grinding of these files. And they could act as like, a, if you take a micro CT of some of these cases, you will see that, uh, or an SEM of these files, you sometimes can see these little tiny bites out of the nitide that may have happened during the conventional uh, polishing procedures mm -hmm. that could act as a nidus of propagation of cracks during torsional movement of the file. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why sometimes electropolishing and things like that will help reduce those uh, defects on the file surface. But um, you know, if you get a whole file breaking, it could be also due to poor press of the hub uh, onto the shank as well. If it's glued versus pressed properly, those are some of the other errors that can happen as a result of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. I think the other lit review I had was just kind of rela related to the... Um, definitions of radix, yeah, right? Yeah, just the so definition that's great. There. Actually, let's go over that. Yeah, so right. a radix just means that a lower molar has a third root. So a lot of times we'll see molars that have four canals, but they don't necessarily have an entire extra root. Right. So the radix would mean an entire extra root. Uh, right, but I mean, not generally, so we're counting on the distal primarily, yeah, right? Because yeah. I mean, on the mesials, you could have mostly one root that is two canals, mm -hmm. but sometimes you could have two separate roots as well. Definitely. We don't consider those radix, right. right? Right. So on the distal root, however, is you sometimes can have. So what is the difference between the types of radixes in, the, on, on, in that area? So there can be a Basically, it can be on the buccal or on the lingual. So if it's occurring on the buccal, then it's going to be a paramolaris. And then if it's occurring on the lingual, it's the enteromolaris. And those are just kind of the terms they use to describe exactly yeah. where the extra root is. You get some cool credits yeah. when you call, oh, I had a radix entomolaris yeah. in, uh, today. <laughs> so it's basically a, you know, a, a molar with three roots or maybe four with the, uh, the distal, with the distal lingual being a separate canal. And mm -hmm. sometimes actually what I found is when we see those cases, especially the entomolaris, which is the distal lingual canal, it does take a very sharp turn towards the buccal. Mm -hmm. So on a conventional x-ray, you don't see that and it seems like a straight root, mm -hmm. but it's actually taking a fairly sharp curve coming towards the buccal. Mm -hmm. So you have to be extra careful while you know uh, treating those or have your x look at a reading because otherwise, if you just try to treat the radiograph, it will, the file will gonna come at you and sometimes you don't see the apex. So those are just some of those potential tips that you may see. I think that was all the lit review that I had for that case. Awesome, so this was a really good case and I love the fact that you built an interesting case that you did already and built some of the literature to support some of the stuff and uh, kind of uh, help alleviate some of the questions about safety and things like that associated with the case as well as educating about nomenclature in this case. So wonderful case, let's cut this one short. We're gonna come back and go over the other two cases in the next videos. Okay, thanks.